I'm a little biased, but there's a lot of moving parts in independent pro wrestling. You've heard terminology such as the wrestling is the steak and everything else is the sizzle or the side dish. You've heard things such as uh, call the stories, accentuate the moves and hide the weaknesses. And you've heard things such as the third man in the ring, referring to the referee. You've heard things such as a referee can make or break a match. You've heard things such as a commentator or commentary can make or break a match. But regardless of what realm of professional wrestling you're in, one of the key things is your introduction, your big fight feel. One of the key things of pro wrestling is the presentation and execution of your ring announcer. This week on the following conversation scheduled for one fall, I have one of the most standstill ring announcers in the independent tri-state area, not just professional wrestling, but mixed martial arts and other realms of combat sports. A true professional and someone that has continued to grow his wheelhouse, if you will, and we're going to get into the sciences of ring announcing itself. Joining me this week, the following conversation scheduled for one fall, Ryan Peterson. Ryan, how are you? God damn, and I've said this to you for so many years, that, that right there is just a fraction of why I think you're one of the best out there. I'm being straightforward because I've known you for That's a long time. I think I've known you for basically your entire announcing career. Yeah, I've known you since the very beginning, uh, all 10 years. It's very nice of you to say, uh, I don't think I'm one of the best or the best. I think Dude, just you're one of, you're one of the hardest workers out there. I'm being on the mic. I'm Yeah, I'll say that. I'll say like, that. Like like seeing you grow from, you know, way back in the day, I think it was Wallington. Yeah. All the way to now in 2024, seeing you progress, you know, you're working with some of the top promotions including ECWA, yep. which is one of the premier promotions in the United States. I I couldn't be I couldn't be more prouder of just seeing you seeing your progress you know expand where it is with many more opportunities to come down the down the road. That's very nice to say, and I feel the same way about you because seeing you graduate to things such as mixed martial arts and larger scale independent wrestling feds and doing stuff in arenas, which is stuff that some of us still haven't even accomplished. Um, you know, I'll start I'll start the conversation a little bit obscure. Who who are some? Because you're around so many of them because it's. It's not the same job, but it's the same department is, is how I label it. Um, who are some some commentators? We're going to get into ring announcing, and that's the ethos of all this jazz. Sure. Who are some of the commentators that, that you like or think are the best? So I grew up um, watching, I think, possibly the best dynamic duo in JR and Jerry Lawler. Sure. Because that was like, you know, the uh, mid, I think that was towards the end of the Attitude Era, beginning of the... Yeah, the, the Attitude Era, beginning of the Ruthless Aggression Era, because that's when I really started watching wrestling fully, because growing up, I watched it, you know, from, like, here to there, because growing up in a single-parent home, my mother <laughs> thought it was too violent for me to watch until, like, yeah, until, like, later on. But uh, definitely those two uh, were literally my my top commentators growing up. And then also um, Mike Today and Don West on TNA, when I started watching TNA. So very those, underrated team. Very underrated and um, just the two of them, both of them, I th definitely both of them showing definitely um, different styles. I know that Jr. and um, Jerry Lawler they kind of show like the you know comedic sports entertainment side, but I feel like Don West and Mike Tenay they were showing more of the sportsy side, in my opinion. Okay. It could be I, especially especially with how like Don West always felt like he was gonna have a heart attack every time some awesome something awesome happens. <laughs> As Don West progressed, I became a really, really big fan of his because I go, I go as far back with TNA as uh, the Asylum and watching the weekly pay per views, oh, and God. they were they were micromanaged. They were told to like scream and shout, and I could just remember like this is not the Mike TNA of WCW. You know, this is a total opposite because if you watch those early tapes, even the stuff on Fox Sports, they are shrieking screaming off the top of their head so by the time they got their act together they they were certainly one of the best teams of the era i i completely agree and i started watching tna i think it, they were just finishing up the fox sports era and they went uh -huh. over and they just started with spike okay I think, I think that's when like samoa joe came in i think that was when scott steiner was still going strong uh kurt angle made a huge impact no pun intended of jumping ship sure sure along, along, along with christian cage so basically, that that era is when I really started watching TNA because, also, I didn't even know about the weekly pay per views until like you know years down the road. Like they actually used to do that way back in the day in the Asylum days. 
Yeah, um, a lot of people uh, didn't know that they did that before TV. And I, th- and you know, looking back at it, it, it sounds very exhausting. I, I feel uh, definitely feel sympathy for the for the uh, production crew that had to deal with that every for the last like for the first two years. <laughs> uh, I guess it's like. I guess it's like the balance of two evils, right? Because ultimately you are putting on a, a television product to a degree or you're or you're you're executing a pro wrestling show. Right. But yeah, I'm sure there's logistically a little bit more uh meat on the burger when you're doing it on a pay-per-view status, especially back then when pay-per-view was the highest arc of premium television. Uh and then you gotta keep in mind that you're you're selling a pay-per-view every week. You want your fan base to give you money every week that's a hard ask in pro wrestling especially a startup and then on top of that you have to give them a pay-per-view quality main event every week which they were doing you know on a regular basis at the time uh but it's still just a hard ask right oh absolutely and the fact that they were bringing i, I did i did research on the asylum is like they brought in like i think cup for a few weeks they brought in freaking um vader they brought in big van vader uh the Legion of Doom. Oh yeah, Vader, uh, the Justin, Road Warriors. Uh, Kurt Road Henning Warriors. was there, oh, my right? God. Just yeah, like when they when they were bringing in like the big star. Hell, even freaking um Paul Bearer was a part of it for a little bit. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> Piper did a couple one offs. You know, there were there were a lot of different guys. Uh, oh, I remember watching that. the pipe. I remember seeing video of the uh, the Piper shoot on Russo. <laughs> Oh, when he corners them in, in, in the ring yep. there in, uh, in the fairgrounds. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. And he, you know, that was a tough subject because Piper literally held Vince Russo responsible for Owen Hart's death, you know? I mean, wasn't Piper somewhat related to Owen Hart, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken? Um, For some reason, they were under the belief that, uh, that they were cousins, Brett and... And Roddy. Right. And then later on, they had it, you know, investigated or however you did Ancestry DNA back then or whatever. And it turns out it wasn't the case. And then uh, they ended up calling each other a cousin for the rest of their lives. Um, We've given TNA enough play. What I'm getting at here is because, unfortunately, you misconstrued the question. Who are some of your favorite announcers on the indies? Because you're around. Oh, on the indies. Oh, I'm so well. I want to go back to the beginning of what inspired me to be getting to broadcasting in the first place. But on the indies, besides you, that's that's without a doubt. I got I gotta love my uh, I gotta love the Ace Crew. You Wyatt, and unfortunately, classic Mikey D. Mm -hmm. Um, but also for uh, Creator Pro, which is another promotion I and Russell Pro. Um, it's a combination. It's uh, Dave Sergio and Josh Chernoff. Oh yeah, the guys that uh that have a lot of seats at the table premiere, sure. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh definitely Joe Dombrowski from uh ML from MLW. Yeah, he's good. He's really I just I just recently watched the Battle Riot that they did this past weekend, whatever the time of this recording, and obviously they he was spot on. Um trying to think I'm trying to think who else because I Oh god, how could I forget? Alphonse Stevens. I can't forget about him, you know. I b- besides all of you, I mentioned. I think Alphonse Stevens is also one of the more underrated commentators slash announcers on the independent scene. I'm gonna put you on the spot. Who do you think's the best? Who do you think's the best commentator? You. No, I, I, I don't <laughs> think. I, I think, I think right now is the best crop of commentators we've had as a whole. In the it's definitely expanded in the last few years, for sure. Huh? It's definitely expanded into like a whole. Oh yeah, post pandemic, it, it's expanded even from the backstage interview stuff. But I think it's certainly the most talented era. I of, agree. Of uh, of the Northeast in a long time, from that perspective, from the table perspective. Um, Unless you're Pete Rosado, you can hear him five states away. <laughs> oh well, yeah, because that's but well, that's because he's. <laughs> He's there right next to the ring, essentially, right? The the running joke is, you, you know, when Pete Rosado is entering a room and you can hear him all the way down to Pennsylvania, and the show's happening in Connecticut. Oh, is that is and we are? I'm sorry. I never, I never found Pete to be that loud. 
You can hear him on commentary too. I just it's a it's a running. Uh, game. Yeah, I mean on on, on the booth, he sure he certainly showcases excitement, but like in general, he never he was he's never been allowed talker with me. I think he says it for the mic, that's why. <laughs> maybe, maybe, because I remember the the times that we the few times that P and I did shows together and we were using some crappy equipment. And oh, then finally, gosh. uh one of the last the last show we did together, we had to, we got to use uh Joe Kim's equipment. Joe Kim wasn't even running Battle Club yet. And um we were like relieved that we had good equipment at the table for once. <laughs> that, that makes up. And, and you see a total change because it's true, the equipment makes you know, makes a difference and you don't have to compensate your voice for a crappy microphone or whatever it was we were using. Um, but Pete's, Pete's pretty good on commentary too. So let's get right to it because I heard, I heard a, a quote one day and this is the ethos of why I always wanted to interview you. Um, it was at an ACE show and, and somebody just straight up said, where did we find him? <laughs> and my response was, oh, I don't know. You guys had him before I got here. So, <laughs> you know, you're somebody that's so well known in the area, but like so many of our guests, like almost the purpose of the show, your story is not out there. We've talked about how you got inspired, um, mm -hmm. born and raised in Long Island. Is that correct? And and still currently living. Still Long Island. Um, how did you formally get into independent wrestling did you join a school did you message a promoter um did you sleep with someone walk me through that <laughs> no it wasn't that one so um back in back in 2010 i went away to college in upstate new york uh called manhattanville college it's a private college in like the purchase white plains area because i'm also a musician and i wanted to learn the business side of music business i did I'll not know what do you play uh, so for the longest time, actually since fourth grade, I was. Oh, like that's pretty Joe. What instrument do you play? Um, well, I play a few of them: jazz trombone, drums, and a guitar, and a little bit of vocals. I didn't know that. And in the crazy world of the tri-state independence, you've never come out playing a fucking instrument. No. <laughs> You're just servicing all of us. I don't want to be the Xavier Woods of the Indies. I want Xavier Woods to be his own thing. <laughs> no, you could be you could be Man Mountain Blob and come out with a guitar instead. <laughs> no one's done a guitar. Oh no, that Rick Boogs just did one. Yeah, I was gonna say. What was the other instrument? Trombone, guitar, drums, drums and vocals. Whole, get a whole electronic drum kit. I'll put your ass on a. I'll put your big ass on a dolly. I'll push out myself <laughs> and just drum solo to the ring to kick the show off, man. Hey, if you, can, if you can pull it off, I'll fucking do it. No, <laughs> so I would so book a show with you and Rob Williams in a drum off. Oh my god, I think he would actually beat me. <laughs> I no longer give a shit about you in the Indies. I want to hear about Ryan, the musician. I want to hear the VH1 behind the music. <laughs> so I start. So my inspiration for music was um, obviously through my mother because she grew up during the disco era, the seven seventies. Oh sure, great like, percussion era, sure. <sighs> And also the uh, the you know the '80s where you know it was transitioning from disco to you know the classic rock and roll like Bon Jovi, yeah, uh, Guns and Roses, and uh, the whole nine yards. Huey Lewis in the news, just that whole mesh. Yeah, I'm a and, big Huey Lewis mark, by the way. And uh, fourth grade, I fourth grade, I wanted to you know get into the you know try to play music. I had three instruments to choose from. It was that, the trumpet, and I think it was the saxophone. I decided to play. I decided for the trombone because I thought it looked cool. And then as years progressed, I, you know, played like the wind ensemble and then played a uh, high school jazz band, which our band won like numerous national awards throughout mm -hmm. the country. And then wow. in college, I, and then college, and then right around like sophomore, junior year, I picked up drums a little bit. And then after high school, I picked up the guitar, you know, just on my own, just, you know, just for casual. And then in college, I took a little, little practicing vocal uh, class or course whatever you want to call it so up in college they had an internet radio station now it's something i never want never tried before and i'm like you know what fuck it let me try it That's and awesome. i love doing it and then what actually and then what got me into were you talking wrestling, wrestling what were you talking college stuff what were you doing i was just i was actually just doing like a radio dj just doing music that's cool. How does that work? Because I know it changes like every five years. Were you allowed to play whatever you wanted? 
Oh yeah, it's internet radio, so we actually had like no licensing issues, and also we um, we were broadcasting internationally because a lot of our students were from overseas, like from Spain, uh, France, Germany. The college I went to was more international based. That's great. And every single and Friday, you degree? I'm sorry. Did you get your degree? Uh, not at that college, but I because I transferred back down to uh, uh, Suffolk Community College for marketing. Good for you. Yeah, I, I decided to nix the music business because there's a lot of musicians out there, but not a lot of opportunities. So I decided yeah. to switch into marketing. It's more fun. So um, back in 2010, a couple of friends, a couple of people I knew from high school who graduated two years ahead of me said, hey, we're actually, you know, wrestle. We're actually, you know, you know, we wrestle on Long Island. You want to come check it out? Now, back then, I knew nothing about the independent wrestling scene. I'm going to be straightforward and honest because I only knew about, you know, TNA and uh, WWE. So and you, didn't, you didn't have any of the, the after mags at the time? Nope. Okay. So October 2010 was my first ever independent wrestling event out in Deer Park, which the promotion is still out there, uh, NYWC. Sure, sure, sure. And it was and it was pretty much their version. It's called House of Madness. It was a, I remember it so well. It was a massive triple threat tag team clusterfuck, like weapons used. And Mikey Whitbrook was a part of the match. Sure. He's, he was the head trainer there for years. And I think he was the tag champ too. And also, um, well, he was he went by a different name, but also um, that's when Cade Lothbrock was still there. Okay. Do you and, have anything from that night? A flyer, a, a event poster, or anything? Uh, I don't actually. I don't see back then. I wasn't really like you know an event flyer type of guy. Okay. So um, as time progressed, you know, I kept going back to the shows and go, shows and whatnot. And then another friend, a friend of mine, I think you may know him too, uh, Dan Acosta. Yeah. Yeah. Black Sheep. Yeah. Yeah, Black Sheep. He, uh, you know, we started, you know, he, you know, brought me on to his band and, we, you know, we actually performed like one of the songs, one of the songs for one of the groups there called Order of the Black, where he was the guitar and vocal. Their manager, Crusher Dugan, rest in peace, was the bass player and I was the drum and I was the drummer. Wow. Um, that was that was a, definitely a lot of fun experience. So then I start. So then I. Uh, met uh, an individual by the name of Benita Guido because my mother joined, uh, you know, myself joined Dan in the charity work and we met him at an Autism Speaks event because my mother was a photographer, as you remember, Cheyenne. Right. Um, we, he was telling me about, you know, another wrestling, another wrestling promotion, which at the time where I was living was about 45 minutes an hour away east out in Shirley. And you may know this company very well, Cheyenne. Um, ECPW. Yeah. So they used to run shows at the sh now infamous Shirley Bingo Hall out on McGraw Street, and I remember that very well. So I remember those flyers, yeah. So so going out there again, you know, just you know, BSing, hanging out with the wrestlers, and then finding out that one of the wrestlers had a school, and I say that term very loosely. It was a nice wrestling ring, but it was in the person's backyard. So and just like you know, every you know, every wrestling fan growing up, I wanted to try the wrestling. I'm going to be for completely forward. I fucking sucked. <laughs> I absolutely was terrible. So, so you went and you gave wrestling and bumping a try. You, you got to yeah. talk to me about that. And did you immediately know, oh, this is not for me? You hit the nail right on the head. Immediately, like two weeks in, I said, fuck this shit. You went a full two weeks of training. Good for you, man. But also, because also back then, um, I think you know, you may know the story or may not, but uh, back then I was pushing a lot of weight. I was over 500 pounds. Were you, I don't think you were that big when I met you though. No, because that's when I started doing the, that's why I started losing the weight. But when, but uh, I'm, I'm jumping ahead right now. So June, 2012, I had the opportunity to attend a seminar with hall of famer, mouth of the South, Jimmy Hart. Okay. And I said, do you know, Jimmy to Mr. Hart? I said, you know, I like to, you know, participate in the training matches that happen after the training sessions, which I think you may know. for those, for those that don't understand what I mean by that, basically it's, um, you know, they, they come in for a little training seminar and then afterwards impromptu matches happen. And then they get, you get uh, critiqued and reviewed after the matches. So if exactly. there's 20 people there, you each basically get paired off um, in singles matches so they can look at you as individuals. Occasionally, if there's tag teams there, they'll do that. He hit the nail right on the head. So I said to Jimmy, you know, you know, you know, Mr. Hart, I, uh, you know, I'm not a wrestler, but I like to participate. Um, what can I do? He said, I'm going to say in my worst accent ever, 
why don't you try ref in the match? Sure, no problem. I sucked at that too. So then wow, go on okay. to the, so then go on to the next step, which was you know the somehow they had a PA system, and I'm just going back to my um, my broadcasting days on the on internet radio, and also at the time I befriended another fellow announcer by the name of Larry Legend because I met him through NYWC, and he was like yeah. telling me he was giving me like a little bit of tricks of the trades and whatnot. So I did the uh, did what I you know would normally see him do, not meant, minus the juicy hot dog bit, but um, afterwards, uh, Jimmy pulled me aside and said, and he actually took off his sunglasses, and you know he never really takes off his glasses. He actually took them off and said, "Son, in all my years of being a part of this business, there's only a handful of people that maybe take off my glasses and shock and awe." That is your calling. He was looking right at the mic. Wow. And then, and then two months later, I August 25th, 2012, I officially made my in-ring announcing debut for ECPW at the Shirley Bingo Hall in front of, in front of a little over 300 people. Okay, good first crowd. And the main event was a steel cage. And I remember the matchup, too. It was Ring King Cash Camacho against Chris Envy. Wow. And I and I hate and here's Chris the thing. Envy from Dynasty, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I hated public speaking. I absolutely hated it. Like <laughs> the best way to describe how I was in the locker room. You've you've seen the movie Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman, right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit. That's exactly how I was in the locker room, walking back and forth, like bumping my head into the wall, just like a lot of nerves. But then once um. I forgot who obviously I forgot who it was. I don't, I know it wasn't Gino because I think he was doing something else. But when one of the guys said, "Hey, we're about to go go out there," within a snap of a finger, the nerves went away and the yeah. adrenaline kicked in and just went smooth sailing from there. Apparently, and that's crazy because ultimately, right? And I and and I'm just I'm trying to be polite about it. You stumble upon ring announcing. You don't have yes. that intention. You say that you want to be in wrestling. You figure mm-hmm. I'll be a wrestler, and yes. you're quickly like, "Oh, that's not good." But maybe there's something else. Same with the refing, and you stumble upon ring announcing. You get on a show, excuse me, and you get a great house for your first show. Three hundred is a great crowd for for anybody, especially on your first one. And yes. you're nervous. You're a little awkward, and then at the drop of a hat, lights on, and you're going out. Pretty much. And like I said to you, when I first started announcing, I was pushing almost 500 pounds. I was huge. So, and and then did that kick in? Do you think part of that was the nerves or with the, with the band performing experience that you had or just, you know, let's, let's knuckle up and get in there. I think the last one, just knuckle up and see where it takes me. Okay. Now this is 2012. So what happens to you? Because I know how Gino runs. So do you become the guy whenever Gino runs that part of Long Island? Do, do you work with Gino on the regular? Where where do you go after the first one? It was a success. Obviously, you're still at it. What happens after the first one? So basically, so at the time, again, I was still fairly new. And back then, he would run like once every two, two and a half months or whatnot. Yeah. So within the first, nah, first seven, eight months, I was only working like, I only worked like three shows in 2012, which is understandable. You know, I think it was one in like September, it was like August and then September, and then there wasn't one until December. So, yeah, because Gino, Gino treats it like a territory. So, yeah, pretty much. And then, um, and then I reached out to, and then, uh, Vinny the Guido introduced me to Joel Maximo of the SAT, oh, wow. which back then he, which back then he had a company called Fighting Spirit Wrestling, and this was out in Brooklyn. So that was actually my first experience doing, you know, a couple of events in Brooklyn. Where in Brooklyn is this? Because he's obviously not at BWF yet. No, no, this was at um, this is like 2013. So this was, oh god, um, I think Sunset Park. Okay. Which back, which back then, the re- the wrestling the wrestling show happened in the second floor of an apartment building. On that the, sounds the, right. The ring, the ring was in the second floor, which was actually, and then looking back, realizing who was on that on the first card I did out there, um, oh yeah, Ortiz, uh, some guy named Mike Santana, mm-hmm. uh, 
Joe Attell, Talon, if you remember Talon from back in the day. Oh, yeah, love Talon. Oh, my God. I, I, I want him back. Um, <laughs> uh, Jorge Sante. The list goes on and on. That was like my first experience of dealing with, you know, the people from the boroughs. Now, I have a feeling you're going to ask how I got into Ace Pro Wrestling. Well, um, this was this was right when um, the Ace Arena closed in Union City. And I think it was like their second show in Wallington where um, uh, JL Rivera was the heavyweight champion. This was beginning of 2012. This was before I got into announcing. Okay. And uh, Cade, I'm going to use this, you know, Cade introduced, uh, you know, told me and Dan to come down and, you know, check it out. I was like, sure, no problem. So we went down there and had a blast. The main event was JL Rivera, Cade, or his former name, and uh, Eddie Kingston. Oh, wow. Where that's where Cade won the heavyweight title for the first time. That's right. That's the night. That was the night. And then, you know, we kept going back as fans. When I'm, you know, just like just like how we always done uh, interacting with, you know, you know, the guys and gals in the back, just BSing with them. So now we get into April 2013. And I think this is the first time Mike was running in Newark. Yeah, he did a couple different spot shows in Newark. And I, I think he did the giant football field. He did a crossroads there, that which is also an infamous story. Oh, yeah. I heard about that story. Um, but no, this one, this was at the uh, the Mercic Room, if you remember. Yeah. Where originally I was actually supposed to, you know, debut at that show in a, at a, you know, impromptu. Because I think that's the night that, well, former announcer, but you know, Uncle Kenny. Uh, I think I think that's where Uncle Kenny uh, hurt himself getting out of the ring. So you're there as a fan the night that yeah. Kenny takes that tumble. Yeah, I was there so, as a fan. So to get everybody up to speed, for those of you who don't know, this is something that 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 diehard Ace Nation fans, and especially the Robert Lotties of the world, would know. Um, <laughs> at a show in Newark, uh, Kenneth Alphone, who was the ring announcer premier of of ace for years after mike lewis um he was the guy he was in the talks he was one of the last guys of that era the indies to still wear the talks and you know kenny was great he, he was money on the microphone Absolutely. and unfortunately one night uh kenny was i i chalk it up to just going through the motions unaware of his surroundings as he's exiting the ring for whatever reason, the guy starts running the ropes, warming up. It's very common. And he ran the ropes as Kenny was exiting and Kenny was holding on to the rope. And that broke Kenny's grip. And Kenny took, from what I've been told by everybody, a bad, bad fall on his head outside of the ring. Yeah, it was. I think it was and, the and, first and, then he, and after that, he's like, I'm never ringing out again. I think that was the first or second match of the night, too. Oh, yeah, it was. it was the opener. Now, I, I think it was, um, oh, God, I think it was Fury that did that. Was it? I think so. I'm trying to remember because I remember seeing that clip over and over <laughs> again. And we tried. I mean, we we uh, we uh we got him as the uh, as the ring announcer at ICE, and he did amazing. But what happened with that was he 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 messed up a couple of names, and he, he just – he was tuning his head about it. He chalked it up to Russ. He's like, oh, see, I shouldn't do this. But that, that was pretty much the night that – that Kenny was like, oh fuck it. And then that was oh. your your gateway then to come on in. So May 2013 was my official ace debut. And um yeah, that was back that was back at uh the infamous building in Wallington. Yeah. I not gonna lie, I always love going in that building. I always for some reason that felt like a second home to me. As as well as you as well. Wallington was a great building and a great era for me. Um, I don't think any of us appreciated it while um, we had it, and yeah. including me. Um, it was, you know, my formative years in wrestling. It was my education. I mean, every day, every show is an education in wrestling, but that was my high school, college, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, Wallington was an incredible building. I was crushed when we lost the building. I was crushed when the town took the building back. Oh, my um, God. And, uh, and yeah, so you basically start in essence in Wallington through the opening of Kenny. Yeah. For the most, and I remember the second show too. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, I got attacked by Cade. <laughs> it was as part of an story. angle. It was all part of the. It was an impromptu last minute angle. And yeah. and how? Please illustrate that for us. And this is this is uh, Cade Lofbrock, uh, Stockade uh, Sybil, whatever you want to call him. I did. I didn't know if we were allowed to say his other name, so that's why I say Cade. So, the main event it was him against Eddie Kingston. Okay. And um, I think Kings. I I still have the video actually. I have the DVD, which by the way, Mike Morgan did sell DVDs. You know, for for the for the newer generation on DVDs, what are those? Um, yeah. So, uh, Eddie wanted to grab the Eddie wanted the mic. And Kate and Kate is like yelling at, yelling at me, and I'm like confused. I'm like, what the hell is going on? He, he grabs me with a suit jacket and goes, fall on the ground. I'm like, okay. And he just like fucking throws me. Wow. <laughs> All on the fly. All on the fly. Now we we've seen you, you know, try to. I when did you start branching out of uh, Ace per se? Because I feel like it was 2014 or 15, almost in. Not immediately per se, about two or three years in, but that's pretty quick. But you immediately uh, started getting um, requests to work other places. Talk to me about that. So I think you were absolutely. I think you're right when you said uh, like 2015. That's when I kind of really branched myself out because I honestly felt like I, I needed more experience. And I said this to Mike sure. Morgan over at Ace, and I'll say this to the day that you know either my career ends or I die, whichever one comes first. Um, <laughs> If it wasn't for Mike Morgan, I wouldn't I wouldn't have known like the basic, you know, st- basic um, skills of like how to present myself on a on a production level. Like, you know, how to work the hard cam, sure. you know, where to stand, you know, the little tiny details that, you know, some people aren't told. But Mike Morgan always and Mike Morgan Jr. too. He um he taught me, you know, especially when it comes to like the camera work. Whatnot, he was the one that was really more hands on, like telling me like where to stand and whatnot. And I can never thank, you know, junior and senior for, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah. Uh, you know, you kind of came in at what we all didn't know would be the end of, you know, Mike Jr.'s run, um, you know, on this earth, unfortunately. Um, yeah. You know, we all took uh, Mikey's death terribly. Um, I, I think about him every day. You can't talk about my career without talking about him. Um, you, you were there at a very transitional part of the company. Cause then, you know, from going from those Newark shows to, uh, all these other weird off kilter towns and then finding a home in Wallington to go back to union city. Um, what do you remember about the Mike Morgan jr. Tribute show? Because you're one of the few people that's been a part of all of them. What do you remember oh. about the first one? Oh my god. Well, first of all, to kind of backtrack a little, I remember Crossroads 10, if you remember that. And in Union City, like four months prior. And yeah, November of 2014, uh, I think. And I remember um my and I remember uh senior beat the shit out of his son. And I remember seeing you jumping for joy out of commentary. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Oddly enough, that is the worst night that I've ever done at commentary. Uh, no, nah, I, I, I doubt it. I no, that's just, that's no. I'm telling you, that's the worst one. Oh, jeez. So, um, when so when we all got the when we all got the uh, the call uh, a month later about what happened, I I think I speak for everybody. We were all devastated. We are all literally our heart. Not only our heartstrings were pulled. We basically I. Most of us basically felt like our hearts were taken out and just stomped on, because we didn't expect that ever. It, we ne- honestly we never expect death on anybody, but for someone like Mike Morgan Jr., who a bunch of you, a bunch of that bunch of us have seen him grow, you know, grow up. It's uh, I'm trying not to get emotional right now. So the uh, the at the uh, the show, the memorial show. I remember literally going there with my mother and Black Sheep. And we can definitely tell, obviously, the emotions were definitely running running high. Sure. And and all I remember, like, right before the show, Mike uh, 
Mike gave everyone, including yourself and me and myself, the Ace for Life armband, which I still hold near and dear to my heart, and I carry it with me every show that I go to. Um, but I remember, you know, that night it was big. It was I felt like it wasn't just a tribute show. It was basically like you know, as Mike always say, Crossroads is their version of WrestleMania. Nah, I felt like that night was there was basically Ace's new WrestleMania. Because the the energy was the energy was impeccable, uh, the just the matches were solid. Every everything about it was absolutely. Well, top it match. was it was a stacked card. I mean, uh, Ve- Vegas and Lethal, Vegas and Lethal, Ricky Richards and Donovan, I believe, against Drastic and Ortiz, who were still at EYFBO, mm-hmm. um, Santana and Ortiz. Um, Eddie Kingston worked that show, Moff and Stockade, first time ever was on that card. Um, what you call it? Uh, Apollo was on that show. Vinny, uh, Crowbar and Savio Vega were supposed to be on the show, but Savio couldn't make it because of a flight delay. Crowbar was still dealing with, uh, I think he was still dealing with his like, like with his, uh, a leg injury because he slipped on, uh, on ice in his driveway. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, like you said, Lethal in Vegas, and of course the first ever Memorial Battle Royal, um, <clears throat> which was, it's so crazy. It's one of those weird reminders of how death brings people together because it was, it was a, it was a family reunion as we mourn the loss of our most beloved family member. Um, because I, Mike had opened the Battle Royal to anyone that had ever worked the company. And I, and I remember there's like so many familiar faces that I even watched. That I even seen on like other indie shows that I've you know met throughout the years, like seeing them, you know, being a part of it. I thought it was I I thought it was incredible. Yeah, at one point Mike was afraid of the battle royal not ending. <laughs> he was he was literally like, This is never going to end. Well, maybe that's what we wanted in the first place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a tremendous outpouring and showcase um of love for someone who we love every day. Yeah. Uh what were some of the first feds you started um, working at outside of Ace in 2015 and 16? So it's right about there is when you get Creative Pro 2 for those Sunday shows they were doing, right? When Hawkins first got released, when Myers got first got released. So, yeah, right around 2015, that's when Creative Pro kind of, you know, kicked up a little bit. They actually were Friday shows back in the day. Okay. And the first, the first year they were like Fridays and uh, Saturdays. And they weren't running like every, they were running, you know, consistently. And then during the summer months, they were like, yeah, we're not going to, because the, the building, the school that they're in has no AC. And we were like, yeah, no, we're not going to kill ourselves over AC, over no AC. Although there were a few uh, moments where um, he had a feud with Grimm from Grimm's Toy Show. That's right. This was 20, this was 2016. And they decided to do a ladder match at the school. And we didn't expect to, we didn't know what the turnout was going to be like. We actually turned people away. Because it was 95 degrees outside, and in that building, at another 10, 15 degrees. Yeah, just about. That was the same issue that used to happen in Wallington. Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, besides uh, Creator Pro, honestly, it was – and then I kind of took a step back from ECPW because they weren't running as often. Ace, uh, Ace in was In terms always, of close to your house or in general? In general. they okay. Because we lost, because at that time, we lost the building at uh, in Shirley because I think went went down to an LA Fitness. Yeah, it got it definitely got turned into a gym. I just can't remember what what chain it ended up being. I think it was an LA Fitness. Mm-hmm. So they weren't really running as much. They were running at most like two, three times a year. I'm like, I need to stay consistent. So that's when you know I met. I you know continued with Ace, and then uh, Five Borough Wrestling was the other one. If you remember that day, of course I remember with Troy. And I actually started with them <sighs> mid 2014 because that's also when I came back to Fighting Spirit Wrestling in Brooklyn, and this was. In a bigger in a bigger place, um, in a massive warehouse garage in uh, Brooklyn. I think it was East. Uh, I think it was 29th Street. Yeah, and um, that's where I met Troy Thompson with Fireball Wrestling, and then my first show at Fireball Wrestling is PJ micro- Stackpole with them. Yep, and uh, the microphone had issues, and I remember the main event was to crown the inaugural champion, which at the time was Tony Nese versus Kurt Hawkins. Yeah. Or formerly known as Brian Myers. That's when he just got released from WWE the first time around. 
So he was telling me about uh, Create a Problem. And I was like, you know what? He invited me to work a birthday show. And that's, you know, I, and that's where I met uh, Pat Buck also. And, you know, then February 2015, that's when I, you know, became a part of their first live event. And the fact that they just passed 10 years, which is insane. Yeah. And I've been on every single event of theirs. Because at that time, I was going, I was just going through a little crossroads in my life and the announcing world because I really didn't have any Long Island Fed. I did, I did a tryout with NYWC and let's just say some backstage political BS with a former owner um, kind of screwed it up for me. Wow. That's a, that's a story for another day. Right. Uh, just, But I will say, though, it was a rookie greenhorn mistake, and I lived up to it. The guy, the guy was just – the guy is so old school that his thing is what's done is done, no matter how many times you fucking apologize. I'm like, whatever. Okay. So I really didn't have a Long Island home. And then when Creator Pro opened up and told me, and Brian um, introduced me to Creator Pro, that's where I felt like that was my Long Island home. That's where I felt like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm finally doing shows at home because I, I I didn't mind going to Jersey or Brooklyn or Queens, but I needed something that's consistent on Long Island. So that's where Creator Pro came into play. Mm-hmm. And then a, I did a couple of stints with, um. Back then it was oh um it was SWF like in the early days of SWF yeah that's about when they start yeah I think that's when they transitioned from from uh, Genesis to SWF it was a weird transitional name um and then twenty fifth and then end of twenty fifteen I actually attended my first ever MMA event out here on Long Island because that's when they just started uh doing a- amateur MMA and I introduced introduced myself to the promoter trying to get my foot in the door. Mm-hmm. And then a couple months later, the promoter hits hits me up and says, "Hey, do you wanna do you wanna announce uh, on February 10th, which is you know their next event?" I said, "Sure, no problem." And was I nervous? You damn right I was. So that's how I that's that's that was. How the was start that your first my... arena show? So this one, this one was in a indoor sports complex, but when I tell you the amount of people that were there, if you thought the first show I ever did was 300. This one had a little over 800. Mm-hmm. And one of the fighters that night was got was John Gotti Jr. Now, um, walk me through this because I've openly, and I got no problem saying this, other other announcers will, will tell you some other stuff. I've never done an arena show. So what are things that you that you do and don't do at an arena show as to your basic garden variety indie? So I'll give you I'll give you a great example. When I first Are started walkthroughs, doing, rehearsals, give us the 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 no. So when it comes to arena shows, like my first like real arena show was 2017. And this was up at the uh the Westchester County Center up in White Plains, where uh WWE does the house shows, and that and oh, that yeah, draws a little over, and, and that draws a little over five thousand. Now my only th- my only it wasn't just only a uh, like a rehearsal thing, but also you got to get acquainted with the sound system of the building, right? Because obviously, like you know, if you're in a small like VFW hall, the walls you know are like so close you can hear the echo bouncing off the walls. Yet, if you're in a massive arena, the speakers are like way beyond the opposite end of the arena or so far so you know high up, but you know put out, you really can't hear them. So you have to just you know. Use your better judgment, I guess, mm-hmm. and that's and that's why you know beforehand they always do a they always say you know hey let's do a mic check before the fans even come in so you can actually you know get yourself accustomed to where the you know how the uh, the system sounds. And I remember this one; I consider it my biggest one. Was the end of 2017 where I get a, where I you know I'm reaching out to promoters and whatnot and. Now, now I'm doing MMA and kickboxing as well. So I reached out to a MMA promotion up in Connecticut, and I thought I get, I thought I give it a shot. And literally within like two hours later, the promoter immediately comes back and goes, uh, "Are you free next week?" I'm like, "What do you mean free next week?" And it was, and it was just like right before New Year's, and their first event was that was that following weekend. I think it was January fourth, twenty eighteen. It was at Mohegan Sun. Wow. 
and not not in the ballroom or the wolf den great places but this was actually in the big arena yeah so of course that's when i started shitting bricks i'm like ah oh, here we go like i was i was starting to get nervous cuz i used to go up there a, i used to go up there all the time you know obviously as a kid with my mother who you know loved going to Mohegan sun went up there for concerts shows so the fact that i'm sent, you know be, getting this opportunity to announce in Mohegan sun in the arena where a lot of a lot of notable names and acts have gone through those doors. Obviously, you know, with WWE, um, Bellator, when they were running, were in there. And also Bon Jovi, Alice in Chains. You know, the, the list of, you know, artists expands. And the fact that I'm getting the opportunity to stand on that on that same very floor performing, oh. per se. So, uh, that was my... And luckily, that's only like twice a year. So, I call that my mini vacation. <laughs> um... But every time I go up there, you know, it keeps getting, the crowds are, you know, when I tell you that place is electric, that place was electric. The last, last couple of events, we actually, we actually sold uh, 8,000 tickets per show. Now, when you go and do the MMA stuff, do you get to do your intro and say your name that you're Ryan Peterson or does the lower third handle that for you? Lower third, lower third. Gotcha. You're just strictly business. Welcome to the event. Fuck me. Here's your next contest. Pretty much. Gotcha. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Especially, especially now, if you have, especially if you have fourteen, fifteen fights on the card. Sure, it's it's you, bang, you bang, wanna, boom. Yeah, you don't want you don't want to take it away from uh you know the from the action. Now, talk to me about your experiences with big time wrestling because that was also another big get for you. You're not there as much, but but what was uh what was the genesis for you being there for those handful of shows? So I felt like big time wrestling, especially during, I think it was 2016, 2017, that's, those felt like the massive mega indie uh, shows because of obviously the names they brought in. Oh yeah. The, my first, I remember my first one, it was in Washington Township and the headliner was Sting, who just got inducted into the Hall of Fame. Oh wow. Yeah, it was uh, September 2016. I still have the photo to prove that I, that I announced for Sting. Um, and also that's when Adam Rose just got released from WWE too. So he was, you know, wrestling. And I think that's where I met Slick Wagner Brown too. Okay. Nice, nice throwback, man. And also that also Tommy Dreamer was on the card. Obviously Tommy Dreamer is everywhere. Um, and also, uh, there was, a, there was, a, there was their main guy. Well, a couple main guys. One of them is, uh, Teddy Goods. Yeah. And also, uh, Flex Armstrong. Who would you say, and and it's your opinion, so that nobody could get all bent out of shape about it. Mm-hmm. Who would you say is the biggest name you've you've announced? Oof, and that's tough too because that's a long laundry long. Because laundry. you've been pretty blessed with throwing a couple out. Well, obviously one of them is Sting, but the other one, it kind of was. That's right, a hard one to top, Ryan. So whatever you pull out after Sting's got to be pretty damn good. Brett the Hitman Hart. Oh yeah! All right, Brett the Hitman Hart in Alaska for Russell Pro, right? For Russell Pro. Okay. Would you would you work with Russell Pro again for the Russell Pro Alaska stuff? Yeah, uh, if you, if they protect the opportunity, I would say yes. Right. So KM, if you're listening, hello. Um, because <laughs> I worked with Russell Pro in Jersey. Yeah. And I and I did a few stints out in uh in Alaska with them, and always ugh, I. If you ever get the chance, go to Alaska. It's awesome up there. Yeah, and, and Kevin Matthews and Russell Pro is providing pro wrestling, which, believe it or not, it's a market, and they're star for it, you know? So it's a big deal when wrestling of any form comes to town, and Russell Pro ain't just any wrestling. It's it's the big leagues, man. They, um, they, just, they just had a Russell Pro Alaska just had their five-year anniversary event. That's right. That's right, with new belts and everything. Um you know, Ryan, you just talked about doing this for 12 years. You've done MMA. You've done cage matches. You've called for Hall of Famers, legends, and independent pro wrestling icons. Do you still have goals doing this? Of course. And what of course. are they? And obviously, obviously the, main, the main goal is to get that, you know, it's, it's a joking term, but, you know, that big money contract. Yeah. You know, whether it's, you know, with, you know, the people up in Stanford or the people in uh, Jacksonville or – trying to think the office is in Canada now with impact. I think I don't know anymore, but you know, just get, or 
Or, um, especially with what's been happening as of late, maybe some, maybe some uh, UFC or maybe even some PFL, from what I've been hearing. Mm-hmm. Now, would you do UFC and PFL? Would you would you leave wrestling and do that? Uh now you really put me on the spot. Uh at first I would actually try to I, I would be the type of guy to make it work. Cause I know, especially for UFC, you know, depending on when they need, you know, if they ever booked me and when they need me for, it would be doable. Cause I know they run like every single week, but you know, yeah. But like you know, if it do like you know like a fight night in uh, Long Island, and the following week they're in like Dubai or whatnot, they probably would have someone do the stuff. You know, again, it would be doable. And same thing with PFL because PFL is only a short term, uh, short term. I think it's only for like six months. Okay. Because because what one thing with the PFL is they do um they have a regular season as they call it. Yeah. Yeah, that it's yeah, PFL's apples and oranges that are counterparts, but yeah, they're a little bit more logistically different than than the streamlined coverage. Uh what do you think is your defining characteristic for success? Because in all reality, you're booked every weekend on no less than two shows. And besides your work ethic, you know, is it your availability? Is it your presentation what do you think it is that lets promoters know i gotta keep using this guy well i think also besides all that stuff because that all that is right on the money but also i use my marketing background to market myself out as a as a brand like i'm you know myself as a brand to promoters like i have a you know resume business cards um, you know, just try to market myself out there and also keep in contact, you know, with promoters just in case of some, they, some people are like, wait, who are you? Like, who are you? And, but also mainly the availability part also. Where's one place that you haven't worked yet that you would like to? Oof. Right now. Cause I, cause I actually, uh, maybe you might know this. I did a little stint with impact for a little bit. You did about uh three or four shows with them, right? Right. Pre pandemic. Yeah, and I actually had the opportunity to work more, but unfortunately, COVID messed it up. Gotcha. Um, but if I had to choose, I mean, granted, you know, I'm, you know, I'm now the official backup voice of Deadlock Pro Wrestling out of North Carolina. Um, but also, and they've, run at, they've run at the Mecca a few times, yeah. And I think they'll be coming back later on, later on, I think, beginning of fall. Um, so, definitely, maybe MLW. Honestly, okay, okay, which because is a very also, feasible goal. Because also, they they run in one building that I actually have never announced in my entire career, and that's the ECW Arena. There's there's something about it, you know. Uh, Twenty three hundred. There's something about it that it's it's it is a magical place. It, it's uh, we all hear the stories. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's it's. It's one of those places you get into the building and you feel it. Um, and and with great reason. Uh, we've come to the part of the program where we do the rapid fire questions. The worst ring introduction I have ever done. Uh, the worst ring introduction I've ever done. Oh, crap. <laughs> um, oh, the first time I introduced Johnny, uh, Johnny Santos. Because okay. I, because again, Irish white guy, and I somehow I kept in the beginning, I kept fucking up his uh dueño. I said du- uh dueno. That sounds that sounds very Irish white guy. Uh the best ring introduction I've ever done. Brett the Hitman Hart. Favorite person to announce. Uh favorite person to announce uh definitely has to be, and I'm actually gonna kind of not name drop, but it's a, it's a couple people, Bronson, and MJF. Okay. Uh Oh, and popping on. Most That's difficult the... person to announce. Oh God. TJ Marconi. No, I'm just kidding. No, I love TJ. <laughs> TJ's easy. Um, most difficult. 
I don't think I, I don't think I ever really had well besides Santos's like with a hard name or like a lot of nicknames. Oh God, there was one name that I I'm not going to mention names, but this individual had about twenty nicknames in his intro. Ah, is it a guy uh, <laughs> whose last name has five points in it? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I will. Say I, names. I will tell you a quick story without saying names. I was filling in for you one night at Fibro. Oh my god! Yep. <laughs> and you know, uh, I get a guy, and I got the index cards, and this person in question had a bazillion nicknames, and he kept adding more. And I'm writing them down. And I'm writing them down. And I got to the point where I had to do the card long ways to get them all. And then I had to flip the back to get all to get all the names, right? Guy comes out. I hit all these names. Say his name, his actual wrestling name. Music goes down. And he goes, dude, you forgot the blank of blank of blanks. And I mean pushed me into that corner, into that turnbuckle with such aggressiveness. Uh, yeah. And it was one of those things where I'm usually not that person, but uh, not in the business anymore. Uh, so, yeah. So, I, <laughs> I, I get that one. Uh, name you have never ring announced that you would love to. <laughs> And that's a tough one because I actually worked with a bunch of them. Um, crap. Um, names I actually never announced. I'm just going to randomly throw it out there. Adam Copeland, a.k.a. Edge. Okay. The worst indie show I have ever been a part of. Oh, my God. Where do I begin with this one? Because this happened at the Morgan Jr. Arena. It was 2016, and it was for a company called Elite Wrestling Entertainment, or as I called it, EW. <laughs> Is this the show with the backyarders that had like 20 matches? Yeah, and uh, apparently... And the guy fell asleep, and I ran out there? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, first of all, it was originally 20 matches, and somehow... They somehow this is when uh oh god oh god what the hell is it? his his real na- his shoot name was like Ness Lopez I forgot his name is yeah yeah her. yeah he ended up so we Ryan and I did a show for a promoter out of North Carolina who booked the Morgan Junior Arena for a rental and the promoter no showed did not pay or bring or send money and this wrestler at the time Ness. I mean, I, I got paid. <laughs> I got paid. On got my stuck, I mean, I, I got paid because it was a rental. Um, Got stuck with running the show, paying people with his own personal money, you know, covering ends. How that happened, I don't know. And Jordan Grace is on the show and Jonathan Gresham. Jonathan Gresham was like two weeks out from being CZW champion. Yeah. Um, That was the first time I ever met him. Uh, That was the first time I worked, worked with uh, Jordan, too. She was pretty cool. Yeah, they were cool. Um, uh, C Bunny was on that show. A bunch of people. I mean, and and a lot of riffraffs too. Yeah. So anyway, Ryan are, and I are on this show, and I mean, it's a legit twenty matches long. There are people in gear, in sweatpants. It's a shit show. And at one point during the show at the Morgan Junior Arena, we're looking at the hard cam, watching this chaos, this four way match, or it's a battle roll, excuse me, and a guy sleeping. Because I think, I think they drew like I think they drew almost three people. They drew like yeah, if that. And a guy is in the back row, straight <laughs> knocked out. And Morgan, do you fucking see this shit? There's a guy <laughs> sleeping out there, and these guys are fucking not taking any of these matches home. So it's a battle royal, mind you. And he goes, Cheyenne. I'm going to play some music and I want you to fucking run down there and get a picture of this guy right in his face. (laughs) 
And my stupid ass was, you don't want me to win the battle royal? No! Get a fucking picture of this guy. And sure enough, he plays some music. <laughs> the match that. comes to a halt. They're like, who is this coming out? It's not supposed to be Brendan the Destroyer or whatever it was. It's me doing my my goofy ass run. And I'm going, these guys now ready up because they think I'm getting in the rumble. And I go around the ring and get in the guy's face and get a picture of him. On one of my phones, I still got it. And I remember yeah. when I see you came out, I was on the, I was literally standing in the hallway. I'm on the fucking floor dying. Yeah. 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 And then I think I just got the phone, got the photo. I got like three or four of the guys. And I just went back up the ramp, Vince walking to, to be funny. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 remember that, that. I remember that show so well because originally it wasn't twenty matches; it was originally twenty-seven. Yeah, yeah, to shoot. Yeah, and they asked, and they asked me, you know, to get they help ask my help. I don't know why they asked my help to condense it. There were so many fucking fatal four ways that, that the name of the show should have been called Fatal Four Way. Fatal four ways, and I mean, like th that was the first time on an indie I ever saw. Like the match is over, kick out at one, kick out at two, kick out at one point one. It was it was wild. What about what's the best show you've ever done? Oh, Deadlock. Yeah, De my first time doing Deadlock because I've always wanted to, you know, always wanted, you know, they were they are literally the biggest, fastest rising independents out there. Obviously, you know, besides Ace, that's you know, Ace is Ace will always be there. <laughs> well, Ace is a, is a is is a legacy fed. You know, you that Deadlock is up and coming still. To your point, um, um, I want to get I want to ask real yeah. quick. Um, why did you stop being on Around the Ropes? I, Honestly, I think I think we I think we as fans mm -hmm. accepted it, but didn't understand. Yeah. So what so, you know? I really that? didn't get. I really didn't give an explanation, honestly. Um, during, okay. This is definitely going to be on the personal side now. So right around Halloween, I um, I experienced a uh, very traumatic mental breakdown, dealing with work and everything, uh, to the point that, um, and also with a few family members telling me, you know, pretty much putting blaming me for my mother's failing health and death. That didn't add on to it. So basically, I all basically almost took a never-ending swim in Oyster Bay Cove, if you know what I mean. So, um, but obviously I didn't because I didn't know else I want to be here right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's when you know I you know obviously gone back to you know taking care of my mental health and whatnot, and then dealing with and then dealing with um, honestly, I was just burnt out at the same time because work was kicking my ass and still doing the announcing. Yeah, and then uh, you know, having to help maintain with the podcast and whatnot, I'm like, you know, what, honestly, I think it was just being too much. So honestly, I decided just to step away and just take care, never have time for myself, and do what I you know love to do what I love, which obviously you poke fun all the time, and that is go enjoy Broadway shows because I always loved Broadway growing up as a kid. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't poke fun at. At that you like Broadway shows. I never make fun of people's passions unless you, it's something that I find. You think I go to shows for free? But here's the thing: I don't. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think you go to shows for free. I just don't get how you get such great seats every time in those lotteries. I have no fucking clue. They they just randomly just give them to me. <laughs> just just admit you're sleeping with somebody. Be a man. Uh, listen, it, it it it's 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 been a pleasure, and I'm I'm so happy you did this and wanted to do this because I feel like. Uh, you and the ringing out to roll in general uh, is extremely unsung. And I felt like everyone knows you, but doesn't know your journey. And um, you're at so many places and your story and your success and what makes you successful should be out there. And, and I'm so glad that we got to do this. Um, much respect for you coming out and admitting your mental health and, mm -hmm. and taking us down that road and talking about why you felt it was best at that time um, to get away from podcasting. I hope you, uh, I mean, you and John are still great friends, which is awesome. John's a great guy too. Um, I hope you guys uh, get back together on the podcast front. And, uh, you know, I'm always. Occasionally I'll pop up, like just recently, uh, just recently him and I did the uh, the watch along for uh, 
Backlash France at the watch along in uh, the city. Yes, yes, that's for the for the live party that you guys did, right? Yeah, and I was yeah, I was like, you know, fuck it, just why not? Because also, I never really experienced, you know, the last time I experienced a watch along party was with Recombination Wrestling. I think it was SummerSlam like two years prior. Oh, at the uh, at the Hooters, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. AJ Pan being old clown shoes, yeah. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm glad we got to do this. I look forward to seeing you at BCW. Why don't you plug some of the places you're going to be at for the month of June? So, uh, by the time of this recording, uh, coming up, I got Victory Pro Wrestling uh, as they come back to Bayshore. The following day, the 9th, uh, when, when this, um, Cap TV is coming back. So, we're doing another Cap TV taping. Uh, June 22nd, I think I'm doing MMA in Queens. I'm just waiting on the final call for that one. Uh, I can say, though, for July, on July 16th, I am going to be the official voice of Fight Factory Wrestling down at Martel's Tiki Bar. So that's going to be a lot of fun because they have uh, Matt Cardona coming in. Um, Danny Moff versus Casey Navarro for the inaugural championship. Uh, Lady Frost versus Steph Delander for the inaugural women's championship. Mike Kyoto is going to be officiating those matches. And That's also a big a, show on the boardwalk, right? At Martel's Tiki Bar. And also uh, kind of a reunion of uh, Dana Brooke and uh, Mandy Rose. It's going to be going to be very exciting to be a part of any of those super cards. And you're going to have the best seat in the house doing the best job. I love that for you. And I'm always rooting for you. Ryan, keep at it. Keep at it. You got, you got as much a chance as anybody. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Be sure to share. Thank you all so much for joining us. The following conversation has been scheduled for one fall. We'll see you next time, fans.